So one Soviet citizen says to the other, I want to sign up for the wedding list for a car. How long is it? Response, precisely 10 years from today. Morning or evening? Why, what difference does it make? Well, the plumbers do in the morning. So that is one, <laughs> <laughs> one of many of a type of joke that uh, you don't see anymore. And that is the rich, the rich reservoir of uh, communist jokes, that is, from Soviet Union and the kind of Eastern Bloc countries. Kindly compiled by Ben Lewis in his book, Hammer and Tickle, the Story of Communism, a Political System Almost Laughed Out of Existence. So there you can see that. It was also made into a documentary, I believe. Um, I haven't seen the film, but uh, the book is quite in-depth. This guy actually had kind of an obsession with, with jokes and communist humor, and not only collected as many books in as many languages as possible that he could find, just from like small presses in all kinds of countries, all kinds of languages, collected them all, went to all these countries to talk to people and, and uh, record all of the jokes, because this was a big thing in the Soviet Union, right from the beginning, and went through some phases, you know, as the different phases of, the, of that, you know, system progressed throughout the years. But um, it created this, like I said, this body of jokes that was kind of unique. Well, it, uh, he argues it was unique um, in, I guess, the, the wider field of joke study, <laughs> jokeology, I don't know what it is. Um, but then when communism fell in those countries, it kind of went away. There's still political humor, but there was something about the communist jokes that, uh, that made them particularly... Um, resonant at the time and among the among the peoples in in these various countries. So um, we're going to be talking a bit about that, a bit about the context, and mostly just telling a lot of jokes, hopefully, <laughs> because some of them are quite funny. Um, and I guess not having been raised in such a country, it's, I guess some of the jokes you kind of had to have been there in order to to really get them. But I think I think they're pretty clear in the. They trans. They, they, you can you can get an idea of the why the joke is funny and uh, without too much explanation. So yes, he uh, <laughs> he reg writes regretfully that so many had to be left out because they were parts of uh, based. They were partly based on puns, mm -hmm. on you know local slang, but this idea of of being able to comment without too much consequence. Was was sort of the currency of that particular aspect of the culture, hmm. and and why even have as a subject of our show today the jokes of uh, Soviet culture, and the reason is I think in part that the the jokes reflect a very deep disquiet and a sense of uh, helplessness that uh, most people had to do anything else but joke about a system that kept them so oppressed, so subjugated, uh, so lacking in basic uh, services, uh, so deficient in, uh, in, in any kind of humanity for so many decades. Uh, so this was a, a kind of a, a, a healthy outlet uh, for many of the people, not only in Russia, but in the Soviet bloc. And uh, Lewis gets into that a little bit too in his book. He discusses the fact that a lot of these jokes uh, are common to uh, Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria and a, num a number of other countries that were in the sphere of um, Russia and the Soviet Union. They were part of uh, th this whole system mm -hmm. that had um, that had influenced the, the thinking and the empowerment of the party, the Communist Party, as we've come to know it. So uh, there's a lot of insight into how people were dealing uh, psychologically and emotionally with the political system as it was. Well, it was a way of standing in the face of uh, having to affirm the exact opposite of what was right in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. But you had to stand there and say, oh, yeah, everything's fine. You know, production is perfect. The crops are great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, well, a couple, a couple different things. Like one, he points out that he thinks... 
the the reason for the reason for this particular type of humor and the reason it was the reason that it existed, or at least part of the reason, had to do with the nature of the the communist system. So there was there were three um, three features that led to it. That I'll see if I can remember them. One was the just the absolute ubiquity of communist propaganda. So everywhere you turned, whether it was the newspapers or billboards, you were constantly bombarded with the propaganda. <clears throat> and so, of course, every normal person could see the, the disparity between the propaganda and the reality. So there was that automatic kind of disconnect bec- just because it was everywhere and so obvious and in your face. But then there was the fact that the, the government was essentially uh, this you know, totalitarian dictatorship. So you couldn't say you couldn't you couldn't stand up you know on a on a street corner and just tell the truth because chances are you'd be arrested mm-hmm. and uh i forget what the third the third one is but uh i'll find it eventually and just to just to give an idea of um of what this was like he in, in the introduction he kind of gives the just some background information some people he knew and talked to um some friends of his and he gives the example of um well first i'll just start with another joke so he's talking to one of his Romanian friends, and they say, they relate this joke. Um, okay, well, it's a couple. So why, went another co- Rom- Romanian communist joke, did Ceausescu hold a mass rally on the 1st of May to see how many people had survived the winter? Another one, do you know when the foundations of the Romanian economy were laid? As far back as biblical times, Jesus was put on the cross. They asked him to stretch out each hand and knock a nail in. Then they said, Please cross your legs. We only have one nail left. So um, his friend was this this lady, Doina, and she she insisted that uh, joke telling was dangerous. You could go to prison for it. And she points out some examples. So she was basically like a copy editor at uh, the Daily Gazeta, and there were certain problems that you would run into because, as in most languages, you know. Certain words, if you just change one letter, you get a different word. So Ceausescu's first name was Nikolai. And if you just changed a couple letters and changed the spelling of it, uh, Nikolai means small penis in Romanian. <laughs> so she had to be extra careful to make sure Nikolai was spelt ev- you know, correctly every time, because otherwise you might be calling him small penis Ceausescu. And, <laughs> and uh, that wouldn't go over very well. <laughs> and there was another one, the... The word comrade. So if you, you know, several months ago we did a show on communist propaganda and talked about the the researchers, I, th- I can't remember if they're Czech, I think they might be Czech, who did a study of word usage in in the propaganda pieces. So they took all of the, all the newspapers and, and pamphlets and did like a word analysis to find out which were the most used words. And of course, comrade was up there, one of the top ones. But in Romanian, if you change one letter in comrade, you get wicked convict. So if you're talking about, you know, you're talking about your comrades and you accidentally call them um, wicked convicts, that would be a bad thing. So one morning she'd ac- she'd accidentally done this. So uh, I'll read what happened. So one morning when I went to work, my editor told me that I had to go to the comrade in room such and such, which was how they referred to the security officer. I said, my goodness, what did I do? And he said, look on the front page. You, missed, you misspelt the word comrade. I was questioned for several hours about this mistake. They asked me if I supported the party, and they interrogated all my colleagues. Did I ever say anything criti- critical about the government or Ceausescu? Um, my only defense was, you know, I signed off the proof of this newspaper. If I wanted to undermine something or to fight against our illustrious president, I wouldn't have been so stupid as to sign it. But it took me more than f- four or five hours to convince them. So um, one of the points he makes is that in, in, a, in certain time periods, um, in the Soviet Union, for instance, you could go to jail, and you did go to jail for telling jokes. Then with Khrushchev, it got a bit easier. You wouldn't necessarily be arrested. And then it got to the point where you could pretty much openly tell jokes for, like, I don't know, the last 10 or 20 years of the mm-hmm. Soviet Union. Yeah. So it kind of, um, kind of liberalized the, the joke-telling climate. But for a while there, it was, it was pretty hairy. You could get jokes, or you could go to prison for jokes. And there are several jokes about going to prison for jokes. So um, there was another one. Um, I'll, I'll have to paraphrase it, because I don't have the, the page number on, on the top of my head. But this, this was a common joke, and it was actually used in a trial. So I can't remember which country it was. It might have been, might have been Romania. Um, but this guy got arrested, uh, a, like a comedian, a, a joke teller, 
or a writer, you know, he, so he gets arrested and at his trial, they ask him, well, where were you? What were you doing on like, you know, mm-hmm. April 3rd, 1963? And so he repeated the common joke. Oh, you know, why comrade? I was looking at the, at my clock at the same time that I was looking at my calendar. <laughs> I remember exactly what I was doing because like, you know, then that, that was a common question, right? Well, where, where are you at? Where were you? And what were you doing at this time on this day? It's like, well, the only thing they could possibly be doing if they remember that is looking at the calendar and the clock, right? So he actually said that at his trial and, you know, ended up going to prison for however long. Um, so that was the, that was the climate of, or, you know, a, a small picture of the climate of, of joke telling at the time and in these various countries. Maybe I'll, before going on, I'll just read a couple more. So a man drives up to the Kremlin and parks his car outside. As he's getting out, a policeman hurriedly flusters over and says, you can't park here. That's right under Yeltsin's window. So this is a post-communist joke, but same climate or same, uh, same flavor. So the man looks perplexed for a second and then smiles and calmly replies, no need to worry, officer. I make sure to lock the car. (laughs) (laughs) All right. A couple more. So, um, another conversation, one man to another, my wife has been going to cooking school for three years. The other man, she must cook really well by now. First man, no, so far they've only got as far as the bit about the 20th communist party of the Soviet union Congress. End of joke. (laughs) And one final one, a man walks into a shop and asks this, you wouldn't happen to have any fish, would you? The shop assistant replies, you've got it wrong. Ours is a butcher's shop. We don't have, we don't have any meat. You're looking for the fish shop across the road. They don't have any fish. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, th- these are obviously terrible things to laugh about in a sense, but they managed to reveal the, uh, the, the, the gallows humor, uh, the, the way that these people had dealt with uh, such situations and, uh, and, you know, reveal the reality of, life under uh under communist occupation if you want to say that for so long mm-hmm. uh one well, i don't remember or recall where in the book i'd read this but I, I thought it was a great uh passage um that these were the truths uh given by ordinary people untainted by the agendas of historians the propaganda of state agencies or the vagaries of personal memories so uh there's a there's truth that is being communicated and transmitted through this humor that gives an account for uh, the, the lives of these people, uh, hundreds of millions of them, under extreme oppression uh, for quite a long time. And it's very difficult, I think, to get a really good sense of what life was like without these authentic... Uh, personal gut-wrenching uh, explanations or anecdotes, they call them uh, anecdoti. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the humor stems from a Russian tradition in, in humor to explain things through little anecdotes that were humorous, mm-hmm. uh, that, were, that came from the population, that were populist jokes that weren't official, that, that claimed uh, truth to power in a way that a, a newspaper article or a, a book or, or state-funded piece of literature just couldn't. So that, that's a great deal of the value here. Um, in, at one point, he writes of the, uh, the joke <clears throat> as a tool of communication being packed to the hilt with information worth more than volumes of philosophical essay that expose the absurdity of propaganda tricks. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, just to segue a little bit, um, even uh, our favorite analysis of totalitarian regimes, Lobachevsky wrote, wrote a little bit about this culture of truth-telling and communication through jokes. He said, uh, let's see. Uh, and this is from Political Ponderology. This is from Ponderology. Um, let's see. Any attempt to make a society subjugated to the above phenomenon, which is this relentless barrage of propaganda, um, uh, learn this differential experiential manner imposed by pathological egoism 
is in principle fated to failure regardless of how many generations it might last. It does, however, call forth a series of improper psychological results which may give the apathocrats the appearance of success. However, it also provokes society to elaborate pinpointed, well-thought-out defense measures based on its cognitive and creative efforts. For some mysterious reason, those others, the ones that the pathocrats can't subjugate, wriggle out, slither away, and tell each other jokes about pathocrats. Someone must be responsible for this, pre-revolutionary oldsters or some radio stations abroad. So this this idea that, that the innate human creativity of the normal person will not be forever oppressed. It'll find its way out one way or another. And if nothing else, it's always, you know, going to the back room in someone's house or down in the basement and drinking vodka and telling jokes. Mm -hmm. I want to read a couple more um, um, quotes from Ponderology because there's only a few points in the book that he mentions humor, but I I think it's, it's, it's a really important aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Um, So the first one goes like this. Societies governed by a pathocratic system for many years develop the above described natural immunization. That's an immunization to just the, the kind of mind-numbing and soul-destroying um, routine and and just oppressive atmosphere of living in this kind of society, ruled by psychopaths at every level. <clears throat> so they develop this immuniz- immunization along with the characteristic detachment from the phenomenon and sardonic humor. In combination with the growth of practical knowledge, this state should be taken into account every time we wish to evaluate a given country's political situation. We should also underscore that this immunity refers to the pathological phenomenon per se, not its ideology, which explains why it is also effective against any other pathocracy, no matter the ideological mask. The psychological experience gained permits the same phenomenon to be recognized according to its actual properties. The ideology is treated in accordance with its true role. So he just kind of embeds the reference to, to humor in this wider analysis of the, the, nature, the nature of pathocracy, which um, exists in its essential form, regardless of the ideological garment that it's wearing at the moment. So you can find, you can find the same phenomenon, whether it's, um, whether it's the Soviet Union or, uh, or some other pathocracy that's not under kind of a Marxist communist ideology. Mm-hmm. And then the other one um, went like this. The development of of familiarity with the phenomenon, pathocracy, is accompanied by development of communicative language, by means of which society can stay stay informed and issue warnings of danger. A third language thus appears alongside the ideological double talk described above. In part, it borrows names used by the official ideology in their transformed, modified meanings. In part, this language operates with words borrowed from Uh, borrowed from still more lively circulating jokes. In spite of its strangeness, this language becomes a useful means of communication and plays a part in regenerating societal links. Lo and behold, this language can be translated and communicated in relations with residents of other countries with the analogous governmental systems, even if the other country's official ideology is different. However, in spite of efforts on the part of literati and and journalists, this language remains only communicative inside, it becomes hermetic outside the scope of this phenomenon, uncomprehended by people lacking the appropriate personal experience. So the, the jokes aren't themselves an example of this language. The language he's describing is more of a, you know, a, a code talk between people living under this system that wouldn't be understandable by, you know, by outsiders, essentially. But jokes make up a part of this language. Mm-hmm. And you see, you see what he's describing. This kind of the the, the almost cross cultural current of of these jokes in in all of these countries. Because, like one of you mentioned at the top of the show, these jokes migrated. So you'd find the same jokes in the in Czechoslovakia or Romania or Hungary or or the Soviet Union, and they'd and everyone thought they were their own jokes. You know, these these are the best you know Czech jokes and these are the best Russian jokes. Well, no, they no one knows who who wrote them. They just they just flowed, you know, mm-hmm. across across these borders and uh, among these people, and it was a uh, it was immediately recognizable. You know, this joke telling culture was immediately recognizable to anyone living under this un- under this system, um, which is yeah, it's, it's really interesting that that happens. 
So do you know what would happen if they brought in communism to Saudi Arabia? What? It would be tragic. They would run out of sand. Yeah. <laughs> and a, a variation on that is <laughs> there'd be oil shortages. <laughs> Well, you have to wonder if uh, there wasn't some hundredth monkey syndrome going on yeah. yep. where these jokes and insights into the behavior of the NKVD, the secret police at the time, uh, where every country had its own version, the Stasi in uh, East Germany and, and all these other countries, I'm sure, had, had some corollary uh, secret police agency. You had to wonder if there wasn't some kind of spontaneous awareness of something funny yeah. That that was almost telepathically communicated as well as transmitted verbally. Well, he says um, <clears throat> much later on in the book where, where well, the, the, the thesis that he started out with is he wanted to prove that humor was one of the major components that brought down communism. Right. And all the way through the book, he keeps slipping back and forth between what was called the minimalist position, which was... The jokes were just to make life bearable and to, you know, provide a sense of comfort and to the idea that this was a way of not precisely organizing a rebellion, but to keep the spirit alive and, and to to augment it. And uh, what was I going to say? The one thing he found is that the jokes eventually, the more they were told, the more they circulated, um, even if they were only attached to the events of the day, because there's a, he runs into a guy who actually did a study on that, an honest-to-God 10-year, one-person survey, um, they created consensus. The further the joke traveled, that, that, was a, that was a symbol and a sign that there was a consensus to that point of view, whatever was being expressed by the joke. Mm. So. Right. So you mentioned um, a minimalist and there's also the maximalist which said it was it was essential in in sort of welding together a, a you know a point of view uh, for the majority that would eventually bring the system down kind of a death of a thousand cuts that exactly. uh, that was powerful enough through the jokes to bring up or um, into consciousness a version of reality an understanding of how things were mm -hmm. that were so bad mm -hmm that people probably in the inner circles of government couldn't deny it. They had to pay attention. They had to pay attention. It was undeniable. Um, and there's, um, well, this actually reminds me of a passage about Stalin, who I think was uh, indicative of the worst elements of communists under the system, who would actually joke about himself, but underlying it was this psychological terror that he inflicted on people in his own inner circle that was sometimes joked about about him, but sometimes joked about by him. Mm -hmm. uh, and Which was just a way of increasing the terror. I, I can make a joke about my own evilness, and, and you can't do anything about it. You know? So Lewis says, Stalin liked to make jokes about his power and his kindness. There's a similar binary structure to them all in which he ironically admits the violence of his rule, but then supplies a punchline suggesting his magnanim magnanimity, excuse me, or vice versa. Once, the opera singer Ivan Kozlovsky, the lead tenor at the Bolshoi from 1926 to 54, was giving one of his many private performances at the Kremlin. Members of the Politburo clamored for a particular song. Kozlovsky hesitated. Stalin said, Let's not put Comrade Kozlovsky under pressure, gentlemen. Let him sing what he wants. He paused for a moment and continued, And I think he wants to sing Lenski's aria from Onigen. <laughs> and there's just a bit more here. In December 1944, at the close of the war, the future French president, Charles de Gaulle, flew to Moscow to sign a treaty with Stalin. At a state banquet, the drunken Soviet leader introduced him to the other guests, the members of the Politburo. He raised his glass to Iron Lazar Kaganovich, whose enforcement of collectivization in the Ukraine and brutal management of Soviet railroads and heavy industry made him personally responsible for thousands of arrests, deportations, and deaths by starvation and execution. 
A brave man, Stalin said. He knows that if the trains do not run on time, we shall shoot him. Stalin clinked glasses with Kaganovich. He toasted the health of the quartermaster general and the Red Army, Krulev, who had performed logistical miracles in the Second World War. He'd better do his best or he'll be hanged for it. That's the way we do things in our country. Stalin then looked at Novikov, the brilliant Air Force commander, who helped turn the tide of the war at Stalingrad with innovations such as tank buster bombs, night fighters, and low-level bombing. Stalin said, Let's drink to him, and if he doesn't do his job properly, we'll hang him. Stalin caught a look of disgust on de Gaulle's face and said to him, People say I'm a monster, but as you can see, I make a joke out of it. Maybe I'm not so nasty after all. Shortly thereafter, Novikov was arrested, tortured, and sentenced to 15 years hard labor. So there's a kind of reverberation mm -hmm. of reality to the joking that was Stalin's that confirmed that he was a monster, even if he made light of it in some contexts. And then he, Lewis has some jokes that the people came up with about this very feature of Stalin. So I'll read some of these. So Stalin is giving a speech to an assembly of workers in a big factory. The thing we hold most precious in the Soviet Union is a human life, he says. Suddenly someone in the audience has a fit of coughing. Who is coughing, bells Stalin. Silence. Okay, call in the NKVD, says the dictator. Stalin's political police, the NKVD, rush in with semi-automatic weapons blazing. Soon only seven men are left standing. Stalin asks again, who coughed? One man raises his hand. That's a terrible cold you've got. Take my car and go to the hospital. <laughs> and then another one. A Georgian delegation has come to visit Stalin. They come, they talk with him in his study, and they leave. No sooner have they disappeared down the corridor than Stalin looks, uh, starts looking for his pipe. He opens drawers, moves papers, but he can't find it anywhere. He shouts down the corridor for the head of his political police, Lavrenti Beria. Beria, he says, I've lost my pipe. Go after the Georgian delegation and see if you can find if one of them took it. Beria bustles off down the corridor. Stalin carries on looking for his pipe. After five minutes, he looks under his, desks, his desk and finds it on the floor. He recalls Beria. It's okay, he says. I found my pipe. You can let the Georgians go. Beria replies, uh, it's a little too late for that. Half the delegation admitted they took your pipe, and the other half died during questioning. So... <laughs> Black humor at yeah. its finest. Yep. And um, maybe we'll, we'll go a little lighter on, on these next few jokes. <laughs> so a frightened, man came to the, to the K, a frightened man came to the KGB. My talking parrot has disappeared. That's not what kind of case we handle. Go to the criminal police. Excuse me. Of course I know that I must go to them. I am just here to tell you officially that I disagree with that parrot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In a prison, two inmates are comparing notes. What did they arrest you for? Asks the first. Why, uh, was it a political crime or a common crime? Of course it was political. I'm a plumber. They summoned me to the district party committee to fix the sewage pipes. I looked and said, hey, the entire system needs to be replaced. So they gave me seven years. <laughs> and uh, let's see, one more. What's the difference between a capitalist fairy tale and a Marxist fairy tale? What, Harrison? A capitalist fairy tale begins, once upon a time there was. A Marxist fairy tale begins, someday there will be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do you guys have any more? Well, I was, I was thinking about this book by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the first circle, which is a harrowing discussion. I'm going to hold this up for a second longer in case anyone wants to look at it. It's a wonderful novel, uh, but again, quite harrowing. It follows the, uh, the lives of scientists and workers and engineers in a kind of a work camp who were under pressure to build certain technologies that would help the, uh, the, the government, basically. And they were doing this for many years. So instead of a gulag where they might be sent for 20 years for some form of subversion, which was quite often uh, arbitrary or 
or mild because so many millions of individuals were sent to these work camps and gulags in Siberia and various other places where conditions were horrible. Uh, so th this was a, by comparison, a, a kind of a luxurious uh, place to serve out your, your sentence if you were willing to spend 10 or 12 hours a day working on technology for the state. And um, Solzhenitsyn, uh, we, we've done a show on Solzhenitsyn's warning to the West. He was so filled with insights. Uh, and he had a number of insights about Stalin. And actually, in spite of the rather disturbing descriptions of, of the reasons why so many of these individuals were put in this prison uh, and sent away for so long, uh, the book is very funny in many places. Uh, the characters humor comes out in, in all sorts of conversations that they have with one another. Some of them, in fact, are diehard communists, but just think that the, the system is, is, needs a little more work or there is a mistake made. But they're ideologically um, adherent to what Lenin originally proposed and Trotsky, perhaps. So you get those points of view, but you also get a lot of insights about uh, the system itself as it existed, and some about Stalin himself. There are a few scenes that kind of follow Stalin around in his uh, in his antechamber, smoking his pipe, reflecting on things, terrorizing the generals that are in charge of, you know, force working these individuals into creating technology, and how this kind of reign of terror um, works from the top down. So it's very insightful, and I thought this passage was quite, uh, well, I'll just read it. Stalin had not trusted his own mother, not God, not his revolutionary comrades, not the peasants. You couldn't trust them to sow and get the harvest in unless you forced them, not the workers who wouldn't work unless norms were set for them. Still less did he trust his engineers. He had not trusted his soldiers and generals to fight without punitive battalions and security detachments to cut off their retreat. He never trusted his henchmen. He had not trusted his wives and mistresses. Even his children he had not trusted. And he had always been proved right. There was one man he had trusted, and only one, in a life free of trust and mistakes. In the eyes of the world, that man had seemed so firm in friendship and in enmity, he had swung around so sharply and held out his hand in friendship. This was no windbag. This was a man of action. And Stalin had believed him. That man was Adolf Hitler. Stalin had looked on with approval and malicious glee while Hitler dismembered Poland, France, Belgium, while his planes blackened the skies over England. Molotov came back from Berlin in a fright. There were intelligence reports that Hitler was concentrating troops in the east. Hess fled to England. Churchill warned Stalin that he was about to be attacked. Every rock on the Aspens of Belarusia and the poplars of Galicia screeched warnings of war. Every market woman in Stalin's own country prophesied war from one day to the next. Stalin alone was unperturbed. He went on sending trainloads of raw materials to Germany and did nothing to fortify his frontiers for fear of offending his colleague. And it's, a, it's kind of funny in a way. He doesn't trust anybody, no one, not a soul, not even his own mother, except for Adolf Hitler, Jesus. which in, uh, in Solzhenitsyn's quite literate way gives you some great insight into Stalin's lack of insight. <laughs> and um, the book is filled with, uh, with a lot of these observations that are quite pithy and, and good. Well, one, one more thing about the jokes before I guess we're going to move on to the modern day iteration of the political right. joke, which is... I still got some jokes. You still have some... Oh, well, we can hear them. But late on the book, in a wonderful chapter called The End is Wry, because he is tracing the uh, evolution of the joke as communism edges towards its end, uh, he talks about the fact that the... Especially in Poland, the elite start to catch on and weaponize jokes themselves. And, and that sort of spoke to me that you had to have a certain minimal 
uh, allotment of intelligence for a joke to be effective on you. You know, like, and he talks about going to see Lech Luensa, who he found humorous, uh, unhumorous. He had like no, no sense of humor at all. He was not very intelligent, not very uh, flexible. Uh, it, it was a complete disappointment because he wanted to talk to him about jokes. And, and the thing is that for uh, 10 years, I think, the Polish government had hired a satirist who had absolutely no loyalty to anybody. He had been on the side of the opposition, and then he got offered a really good job, so he started writing jokes about uh, solidarity and Luenza. But it was like... It's like they finally caught on that this is something that they could use too. But this guy wrote for everybody. He ran um, a Polish equivalent of Private Eye, which is this nasty, vicious political satire magazine in Britain. And apparently his version of it was immeasurably more nasty. But in the end, there was, there was still this understanding that even though this guy was witty and urbane and making loads of jokes, it didn't catch on the way it did with the common people behind solidarity. So, uh, you know, I guess you have to keep your guard up because even humor can be turned against you if you're not alert enough. More jokes. So Stalin is in his limo along with his driver. Let you, let me ask you a question. He asks this chauffeur. Tell me honestly, have you become more or less happy since the revolution? Uh, in truth, less happy says the driver. Why is that? asks Stalin, his hackles raised. Well, before the revolution, I had two suits. Now I only have one. You should be pleased, says Stalin. Don't you know that in Africa they run around completely naked? Really? The chauffeur replies. So how long ago did they have their revolution? <laughs> okay. What is the definition of capitalism? What? The exploitation of man by man. And what is the definition of communism? What? The exact opposite. <laughs> Orwell would be proud. Uh, Trotsky wakes up in the morning. How are you? An assistant asks. I don't know, he says. I haven't read the papers yet. <laughs> oh, jeez. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, I'm just going to go through all my favorites. Okay. <laughs> Stalin dies, and he's not certain whether he wants to go to heaven or to hell. He asks for a tour of each. In heaven, he sees people engaged in quiet prayers and meditation. In hell, people are eating, drinking, dancing, and generally having a good time. Stalin opts for hell. He is led through a series of labyrinths into an area with boiling cauldrons. Several devils grab him. Stalin begins to protest and points out that his tour, on his tour, he was shown people enjoying themselves. That, replies the devil, was just propaganda. <laughs> I was, that's my, one of my favorites too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh. I love that one. Okay. So somewhere in Siberia, three prisoners are sitting together and they finally get to talking about wh why they were deported. I'm here because I always arrived at the factory five minutes late. So they charged me with sabotage, says the first. That's strange, says the second. I'm here because I always arrived at work five minutes early, so they convicted me of spying. No, says the third in surprise. I'm here because I kept arriving at the factory on time, every day. And then they found out that I owned a Western watch. <laughs> okay, a couple, couple more from the, from the Stalin era. So two, two, gulag, in, uh, two gulag inmates are talking about why they got put away. This was a big theme, the gulag jokes. I'm here for laziness, says one. What do you mean? Did you fail to turn up for work? Asks the other. No. I was sitting with a friend telling jokes all night, and I thought, at the end, I'll go to bed. I can report him to the police in the morning. And why was that lazy? He, he did it in the same evening. <laughs> okay. Uh, a, new, uh, a new convict arrived at a prison camp. The inmates began questioning him about the length of his sentence. 25 years, replied the newcomer. What for? Nothing. Didn't do a thing. I am innocent. Don't give us that story. The innocent only get five years. Yeah. 
What's the difference between Stalin and Roosevelt? Roosevelt collects the jokes that people tell about him. And Stalin collects the people who tell jokes about him. <laughs> Actually, there's, there's something interesting about that. Uh, Reagan was a huge fan of communist jokes, and mm -hmm. he wanted them included in his uh, briefings every day. If, if there had been a new joke, he wanted to hear about it. And he started weaving them into all of his addresses. <laughs> you know, this is during the whole time. So uh, he would end, end press conferences, speeches, whatever he was doing was some joke about communism. And a lot of people, you know, figure his ridicule as much as anything else you know, showed his support for the people. And, but apparently he's a big fan and there's a huge collection of them somewhere in, in his library. Well, just looking back at uh, President Reagan in the 80s, you have to wonder if, because I, I hated the guy. I, I so disliked him. I thought he was, you know, one of the worst representations of what a president should be for various reasons. And at the same time, you say that, Carolyn, and I'm, I'm wondering if, because he in the end, got together with Gorbachev mm -hmm. and had some very successful meetings with him, even if uh, the George Bush administration kind of turned around and, and reneged on their promises not to encroach on uh, Russia with NATO uh, in later years. In any case, he seemed to be an honest broker. And if you, ha you have to wonder if maybe Reagan, underneath this, uh, this idiotic veneer of of fake presidential puppetry was trying his best and had some kind of healthy outlook. Mm -hmm. uh, he really believed that Russia was an, an evil empire. And um, I think he, when it came down to it, was sincere about detente and establishing good ties with Russia. Well, you, you could sort of look on them as a, as a kind of a, Maybe this isn't the right term, but kind of a low rent, you know, Khrushchev and JFK. You know, they neither of them had the intellect that the other two had, but I think I think they were sincere. And um, I've I've heard some anecdotes about Reagan that that at least on a personal level, he was a relatively decent person, but just you know, he was had his own ideological possession. But I think as much as he hated the communist Soviet Union and wanted to bring it down, I think that it, it was something he wanted to accomplish without a war, without destruction. And that was Gorbachev's goal, too, who was very, he uh, talks a bit about Gorbachev in the book, who, you know, hit his, what are they, the president, the premier, first prime minister of Russia, and just looked mm -hmm. around and said, this, this is a disaster. We're going to hit the wall. Right. Just in terms of their GDP and production and, and the state of the citizenry and the state of their infrastructure. And he knew that something had to be done fast. So that that also led to the opening. And, you know, whether or not you want to blame that on, you know, Reagan forcing, you know, the arms race and forcing Russia to spend itself into the ground or the Soviet Union actually um, is moot. I mean, I think it was tottering under its own contradictions. Yes. But there was seemed to be this will to try and do it in the least damaging fashion possible. Mm. But that doesn't make a lot of money for the warmonger. So, mm. you know, can't have that. Well, one interesting thing um, I found out about these jokes is that in the early years, it wasn't necessarily a, well, a lot of the joke tellers and the jokes themselves weren't, weren't anti-communist per se. Like a lot of the people telling the jokes were still communists. Like they still, they still might be the like the guys in the in the camp with Solzhenitsyn who were still hardcore communists. They just believed things needed a bit of tweaking, and maybe there was some inept, ineptitude going on. But they still kind of held the 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 ideals. Um, you know, they still valued them. Mm -hmm. And but it it wasn't until like the stagnating like 70s and 80s that the people kind of finally came around to going after Lenin because Lenin wasn't the butt of jokes early on. That was mostly reserved for Stalin. And then finally, eventually, they, they realized the whole system was, you know, was bad from the beginning. So that's when they started joking about Lenin. <laughs> so there's a few jokes about Lenin that, uh, that came out around this time, and uh, they're all really good. So school children come to visit Lenin's widow, Nadia Krupskaya. Granny Nadia, tell us a story about Lenin, they ask. You know children about Lenin's very great kindness. 
she says dewy-eyed. Uh, language warning for this one. I remember once when a group of children came to visit Vladimir Ilyich while he was shaving. Play with, us, play with us, Grandad Lenin, they said. Fuck off, you little bastards, he told them. His eyes were so kind. <laughs> Second joke. When we say Lenin, we mean party. When we say party, we mean Lenin. And this is how we deal with everything. We say one thing, we mean something else. <laughs> and the third one. And then they came out with a bed that sleeps three, because, like the slogan says, Lenin is always with us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Very good stuff. Um, oh, maybe, I mean, I've, I've, I've almost gone through my, my personal catalog of my favorite jokes. But before we do that, I want to share a video. This is a clip from a documentary that was done by the BBC several years ago called The Lost World of Communism. So they find this, this uh, group of people in Romania that basically did this kind of stand-up comedy routine. Well, well, it was scripted. It was more just a live comedy show. So I think that's all the background you need for this clip. Um, and if not, I'll explain some more afterwards. So let's take a look at this. The dreadfulness of everyday life provided rich material for one student comedy group. They filmed this spoof New Year's broadcast by Romanian TV for their private amusement. But before any public performances, all their sketches had to be approved by the censors. It reached the height of stupidity when the Ministry of Culture and Communist Education, I hope my memory is not betraying me and this was the actual name, had issued a list of forbidden words. These words weren't allowed on stage, in shows, on TV, in newspapers, anywhere else. Yes, newspapers too. So these words were forbidden. One forbidden word was dollar. The censors assumed that anyone who used the word must be an enemy of the working class. One of the jokes was that as we couldn't say the word dollar, we claimed we had bought a piece of machinery with rubles. The censors were outraged by this as well and wrote on our script, any other currency. And we said exactly that. We bought this piece of machinery for 300 any other currency. The audience burst into hysterical laughter. It was funnier than any other word we could have used. Because the student audience cottoned onto the fact that we'd been censored. The censor, a really nice guy, didn't want to impose on us the alternative to the word dollar. So he allowed us to choose any other currency, as long as it wasn't the dollar. But we took it literally and said it cost 300 any other currency. People roared with laughter. <laughs> and I, I saw that years ago and, it, and it's, it stuck with me. So when we finally got around to reading this book, I remembered it because just the absurdity of that situation. You know, you've got this list of banned words like dollar. I mean, just like the total idiocy of <laughs> that kind of censorship. And then just, this is, this is the genius of the communist humor, is just flipping that around, taking it, just taking it literally makes it funny. Mm -hmm. You just replace the, the word with the censor's comment and you get just a, a golden joke. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because the people, like the censors, the people coming up with these decisions are totally humorless, right? And yet, if you just take them at their word, they're actually hilarious, Be totally unintentionally. Yeah. Obliviously. <laughs> yeah, obliviously <laughs> hilarious. Um, I just thought that that really just summed it up in, in one way. And then there's, there's another clip. Um, I can't remember if it was in the same episode because it was a three-episode documentary, but there's another one where they said because so many words were banned, they just mimed the entire skit, <laughs> like that, you know, without words, just, and, you know, so it was about like farming or something. And they, and it was, it was also just hilarious because they realized, well, they can't say any of these words. So they're just miming all the actions. <laughs> and that's kind of what you had to do to just to get around it. And these are just regular, you know, funny, creative folks. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. it, just to, it's hard to imagine if you haven't lived under it that something so routine and some so 
just like unimportant, really, mm-hmm. um, or, or you'd think it would be unimportant, would can be banned like that. Like, uh, well, there's a oh, one other point that he makes that before I get into this, this next point is that this really was unique to to the, the the communist system in like Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. You didn't find this kind of humor, at least he couldn't find it anywhere, for instance, in Cuba or, um, or China. Mm-hmm. They just didn't have the same kind of humor. There was something, something specific about the way the communist system was set up in, those, in, these other, in the, the, the Soviet bloc countries that, that didn't translate to, to Cuba or China. Well, he, he did mention that a certain number of the oldest jokes that he could find actually arose from, say, the 16th and 17th century peasantry mm-hmm. who labored under feudalism which you could make a lot of analogies to. So maybe, you know, Korean or Chinese or Cuban peasantry didn't have that same yeah. experience. So so that could have something to do with it. But then within that whole geographic area, feudalism had existed in one form or another, and the jokes just sort of, you know, propagated down the ages. Yeah, so it could be partially the yeah. the, the, the form of the humor is culture specific, you know, mm-hmm. for that area. So you wouldn't find the same humor in a different culture. Like apparently in China, the the um, humor is a lot more slapstick, for instance. So it's it's really you know people people falling over and getting punched and and things like that. And so maybe there's just not the 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 same ground out of which you know these kinds of jokes would mm-hmm. grow. Mm-hmm. But just on the issue of censor- censorship, like there's some everyone knows about China's you know great firewall. But there's some there's some equally idiotic, I think, you know, types of censorship that go on in China, because the you know the Chinese government is just is kind of notorious for that. But several a, a few years ago, there was um, Xi Jinping made a, a visit to kind of this local cafeteria, this local restaurant, and he ate the just a special kind of bun. I think it's like a steamed bun, and the the word for it, I can't I can't remember what the what the Chinese word for it is, but it kind of rhymes with his name. So they were basically, so people, like his, even supporters started calling him, like as a cute reference, like uh, Xi Bun, the same word for bun, right? And so it was kind of this cute thing, oh, Xi Bun. And there, <laughs> one guy, I guess, got too, um, too carried away and got arrested for like 22 months for calling, you know, Xi um, oh no! Like G bun. So it's just like there's when you have government censor, censors like this, they just come up with the stupidest things. Um, and in at least some some examples of censorship, even if they're stupid, you can understand why. Like the, there's there's a, a reason, at least a reason that on the surface of it makes sense to them. To them, <laughs> it, regardless of how misguided it is to actually try to censorship. But then there are like examples where it's just. Why? Why would you even think that? Like you make you make things even harder for yourself by trying to censor this, and you, you probably just gain a lot more resentment than um, than you would if you just let people use s- somewhat ordinary words. Well, I, I think that's actually a good segue into uh, another discussion and, and part of this uh, whole examination of Europe, um, or rather, humor in a, a totalitarian. Um, environment because we've been observing here in the u.s and in europe a stifling of humor uh that that's been going on for the past i would say 10 or 20 years and really ramped up Mm -hmm. in particular in the past few years where people you're not allowed to say certain things Mm -hmm. and it would seem to me that that's kind of a a lesson learned by uh, the, the totalitarian thinkers, or maybe I'm just describing it as to them as a lesson that they learned. Maybe it's not a lesson at all, but it seems to me that all of the kinds of astute observations of where things have been going in terms of a stronger police state in the U.S., uh, Russophobia, uh, political correctness, uh, totalitarian leftist uh, fascist ideology has been, you're not really allowed to talk about it. And so we've mostly been seeing the jokes made about these types of things through memes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because 
I haven't, I don't know about you guys, I just haven't heard any really clever jokes being told about no. uh, any of this phenomena here. And it, you, usually it's just a, a kind of a meme that will put on an article in SOD or that we'll see on a Twitter feed or, or a Facebook uh, feed that hasn't been censored for whatever reason. And, the, and so the, censor, the censorship is, it's here already to some great degree. And, and we're, we've only begun to see, like, I don't think there's enough humor that, that's correctly pointing out the, the types of things that, uh, that are akin to the arbitrary, absurd, uh, oppressive thinking that went on during uh, the, the Soviet Union. Well, you, you could make the, make the observation that we have become a much more visual culture. We're not as oriented to words anymore. So that would, to me, you know, would be, we don't tell jokes to each other, but we send each other memes mm -hmm. like that. And also that um, the thing that I find really interesting is that this is, at least from appearances, not a top-down thing. The censorship has been bubbling up from the bottom. We we censor ourselves now. Like we don't have the the Czech police, you know, listening in on microphones anymore. Well, we've got Alexa. But that for some reason, um, and maybe this comes from, uh, remember Lobachevsky's story about the professor who came who was an idiot? Mm -hmm. And so... Throughout the 60s, our universities from the 60s on have been flooded with hundreds and thousands of these same idiot professors. Yes. And they have inculcated their crazy students or the ones that are susceptible to it. And that has created this bottom up self censorship, this atmosphere of cancellation. You know, so uh, it's a little scarier when everybody around the corner is ready to leap on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there are a couple things there. I think you're right that we are more of a, a visual culture nowadays just because of the internet. And smartphones. And yeah. And, uh, you know, emojis and, and uh, text speak, you know, like we're not very, we're not as literate as we used to be. No. And part of, part of the reason that, part of the, part of the reason for the, the, the nature of the communist jokes in addition to just the pre-existing cultural thing, was that you could only tell these jokes in person. You could only communicate them orally. So mm -hmm. it was this. It was this. It was this underground oral tradition, essentially, mm -hmm. where you'd get together. And uh, I think he describes the the process in the introduction. Describe like the there was a process to it. So you'd get together with a group of friends and you'd you'd start drinking and then. Um, eventually one would tell, a, tell one joke and then they'd tell another joke. And, but, you know, after that, they'd just be going back and forth with all these jokes. So it was, a, it was almost kind of a ritual to, to get it all out of your system. Mm -hmm. Whereas with where we are right now, it's not, we're not in the same cultural societal position yet. So it's not like you have to secretly go to your friend's house and you go down to the basement and you're like, Oh, I heard this good joke. It's like, no, you can just, you can send it in an email. You can, you know, say, tell it at the water cooler or you can share it on your phone with someone. Like there's no, there's no oppressive, um, oh. external, external like police force that, that you are afraid of. Mm -hmm. It's more of a right now, like you said, it's more of this bottom up self censorship. It's, it's, it's um, oh well maybe I shouldn't say that because because that's not really appropriate or that's that's um, that might offend someone or and you'll get a thousand people on Twitter excoriating you yeah. about something you've said and trying to get you fired and trying to get you fired and compelling you to make some kind of public apology right. and and admission of your uh, of your mistake mm -hmm. and your insensitivity and it's almost no different from having you know the communist party the struggle sessions have somebody come before the party and, and admit his mistakes and then go to the gulag for a shorter period of time or be released from the gulag after only a few years. I mean, this is, this is a, a milder version, I think. Um, but it's far more pervasive. It, it has become far more pervasive. Yeah. And that said, I, I think we do have a couple of um, memes here that are pretty good that, uh, that say quite a bit about 
where people are ideologically. This one is of uh, Rachel Maddow, and it says, everything I don't like must be banned. Everything I do like is a human right and must be paid for by others. Th this is that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, it's it's a bit of a boomer meme, but <laughs> <coughs> it is. But but it's accurate as far as it goes. I think. Well, it does fit the whole thing um, of uh, what do we call it? Um, pack to the hilt with information. I mean, just just even somebody answering your tweet with "Okay, boomer," <laughs> it carries a multitude you know, a, a huge amount of information. I'm not a boomer. You're out of touch. Um, my way is better. You are irrelevant. You know, two words. Mm -hmm. Two words is, is a huge amount of information, comp you know, comp mm -hmm. compressed into that. Yeah. So in a way, it's, it's, it's still applicable, this idea of the joke. Uh, they've gotten a lot nastier, though. You know. <laughs> yeah, well, like these these jokes in the, in their own way, they're they're actually rather sweetly gentle. You know, these, I mean, they're making a point, but they're not they're not vicious. You know, mm -hmm. these days the humor is vicious. You know, you got to get really tough hide for them. <laughs> well, here's another meme that we have that uh, that I think is pretty good too. If you don't realize that the human population is being systematically dumbed down, then you have been systematically dumbed down. <laughs> Which is true and, and speaks to what you were saying a few minutes ago, Harrison, about the fact that we're so much less literate a, uh, a society than we were 20 or 30 years ago. People don't write letters anymore. People uh, probably read less. People are looking for the, the quick soundbite to get their information. We are a low information people, uh, even though we've never had as much information available to us as, as, as before. Mm -hmm. So um, these are some ways that we can communicate some of the, the, the things that we're seeing around us. And um, I'll just say I was, I was a little inspired by uh, Lewis's book, Hammer and Tickle. Um, I, I came up with a couple of so-so uh, jokes that I wanted to read. I, I worked on them a little bit with a friend who uh, who gave me the the you know the this and the ha ha and <laughs> so we'll see. I'm going to read them and 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 you guys will you guys will laugh or not or, or laugh or groan or <laughs> groan one or the other or maybe neither. So this is the first one. Two American journalists who specialize in foreign policy meet and have lunch together at a trendy restaurant in Washington, D.C. The first journalist writes for a conservative magazine, and the second one works for a neoconservative think tank that is funded by NATO. The conservative journalist, the first one, can't contain himself, and seeing the urgency in meeting with his colleague begins by saying to the NATO-funded deep state neoconservative writer, look, NATO should stop acting so aggressively towards Russia. The missiles placed in Romania are aimed at Russia. The sanctions you guys continue to pile on, all the provocations around Crimea and eastern Ukraine, if you guys keep escalating tensions, then you'll do something even stupider that will force Russia to defend itself militarily, which it'll feel compelled to do. And then who knows what will happen? It could lead to another world war. Many people might be killed. Cities in Russia, Europe, even here in the U.S. could be destroyed. It could all, it could all lead to horrible disaster. Why continue this madness? The deep state journalist furrows his brow, clenches his teeth, and looks deep in thought. Finally, after a moment, he's taken to collect himself. He answers, you'd really rather have Russia be allowed to show its flag at the Olympics? <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's worth a chuckle. It's worth a chuckle. <laughs> I think you're being generous, but, <laughs> but okay. I've got one more. I had a few more, but... Whittle, whittled, whittled it down? I, I whittled it down to two from four. Okay. This is it. Shortly after the end of a big rally on climate change, 
Greta Thunberg is approached by a mild-mannered older gentleman who introduces himself as a credentialed climatologist with several science degrees and dozens of peer-reviewed papers on climate change under his belt. The scientist says to Greta, Young lady, I would like to offer you the opportunity to sit down with me and some of my colleagues where we can look at some of the key points in our research demonstrating that some global warming is a perfectly natural part of climate cycles, that the Earth is not warming at a rate that some people are saying, that global climate is largely, in fact, dependent upon the cycles of sunspot activity, and that we are now entering a major movement towards the cooling of our planet, and that groups of people are using you towards a political and economic agenda that will actually end up hurting those you seek to help and protect. What do you say, dear lady? Can we meet to discuss all this? Greta looks at the man and says, All of your science and facts and research doesn't make your understanding of climate change as hot as mine is. Okay. <laughs> I tried. Well, if nothing else, these jokes give one to understand just how difficult humor is and, and how, many, how many jokes need to go into circulation before uh -huh. they can it, be... It sieves out the good ones. The good ones from, from the bad ones. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, Lewis said that he, he looked at over 40 books to, uh, to write his book. There was a, a, quite a, an abundance of humor mm -hmm. that was out there on, on uh, communist Russia and the, uh, and the Soviet Union. But it tells you also how many people were focused and put energy into this outlet mm -hmm. of humor. Mm -hmm. But then he points out <clears throat> that I'm pretty sure at one point he says that there were only actually about 1,100 unique jokes, mm -hmm. that it wasn't this infinite supply of jokes. There was a limited num number. And that's, in one sense, that's a big number, 1,100. But in another sense, it's not a very big number. If you think about the millions of people that were telling these jokes and so unique and then the themes were adapted to local circumstance. Yeah. Or, oh. or the, it would, it would just be the same joke and you just change the name and the location. Right. Mm -hmm. So instead yeah. of, instead of Stalin, it might be Ceausescu or something like that. Or instead of, instead of Russia, it might be Hungary. That sounds like, like once I read somewhere that there were only 64 storylines and that all yeah. of the literature of the world is, is drawn from these 64 basic themes so, you know, but people are people. <clears throat> there will be commonalities, you know, mm -hmm. and especially if you're all sharing this, you're laboring under the same constraints, you'll tend to find the same jokes. Yeah, but I think, well, I think we, it might be a bit of both. I think that for the most part, it was just the same joke, like down to the specifics, well, a, a, a level of specificity that got adapted, mm -hmm. you know, just changing the names and countries. Yeah. And... Maybe there's also an element, like you were saying, of the hundredth monkey, like the same kind of conditions will maybe lead to the same joke in different circumstances. Um, it's hard to know exactly how these kinds of things happen, um, but I think, I think it, I don't know, I'd lean more towards the direct transmission, maybe with an element of that hundredth monkey, but um, you just have to, if, if you look at some of the, the, studies on oral traditions and, and research like um, like children's nursery rhymes and uh, you know mm -hmm. the games that they play in in um, in school mm -hmm. and the the, the sing-songy rhymes that they come up with some of them have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years mm -hmm. and potentially longer than that there are some people that some research that researchers that speculate that they've been around for thousands of years and they just travel all over the place and no one really knows exactly how it just somehow it manages to go from school to school and city to city and all these kids are saying the same thing and, and playing the same games and making the same rhymes well there's maybe a certain amount of pattern recognition that that it sort of slots in well yeah and, and it's know? like the good joke it's like the the sieve that that filters out the the bad jokes and the good jokes the the rhymes are perfect in some way mm -hmm. and so kids naturally pick them up because the they're so well constructed mm -hmm. that they're that they, they, they don't need to change so these jokes are these like 1100 jokes are the distillation of all the all the failed attempts at uh, at coming up with a good communist joke and then they just travel all over the place to to the to the extent that you can this guy could find 
different books in different languages published by different people, each claiming that their jokes are the, the original, you know, unique national treasure of their, their community, and they're the exact same jokes. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's the thing, is that there, no one knows one, no one knows one individual who wrote any of these jokes. They, no one knows the authors of any of them. They, they are just something that has sprung up. So it's not like stand-up comedians where you can oftentimes trace back a joke to one guy that came up with it. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I wanted to, I don't know what I wanted to say about it, about um, maybe just in the context of modern humor, that there, there, is this, there is this oppressive climate where people feel they can't tell jokes and often can't because there will be some kind of repercussion, even if it's just character assassination and not hard labor for 25 years. Um, but well, look, that, look at the number of movies that, you know, you look at like, like anything that Mel Brooks made mm -hmm. or movies from the, you know, the sixties that you just think that they could never show this again yeah, or it would never get made again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And some, so, and some actors and writers are apologizing now for the, something they did 20 <laughs> for, years ago for the comic, the, the comedy movies that they, yeah, that they did 20, 30 years ago. It's insane. Um, but you do, but we, we still, we still have um, some comedians that are at least willing to stick their necks out and uh, be kind of the, the lightning rods for abuse and just say, screw it, I'm going to tell my jokes. And people are going to actually laugh at them, but, and I don't really care what you, what you say about, about me. So, mm -hmm. uh, like, there's just recently there have been Dave Chappelle and uh, Bill Burr, mm -hmm. who both had Netflix specials that were just totally... Um, irreverent and um, politically incorrect compared um, according to modern standards today but they've been wildly popular despite bad reviews from all of the um, um, like newspaper editor class people seem to like them it's it's the Rotten Tomatoes phenomenon where you look at the critics and they the critics give it a really low review say oh it's not even worth watching and the audience is giving it super high reviews and saying, oh, you've got to see this. So it's, it's, it's a lighter version of the underground phenomenon that you, that you see in a, in a totally closed society. Yeah. Um, the, right now, we, to the extent that our society is closed, it's the walls that we've you know, put up for ourselves and basically these imaginary walls that, um, that aren't, aren't dictated from some bureaucrat's office that, that are coming up with the, the rules and regulations. It's the, it's a, like a societal consensus that's been going around and there is, a, a like a figurative underground within this system of just regular people who find things funny and will know what's funny mm -hmm. and know what's not funny because you see a lot of the, a lot of humor. It, well, we should talk about that too. One other point he points out that there were there were two types of humor in in the Soviet country in the communist countries. There was the underground humor, and then there was the official humor. So you still had comedy and and jokes in official culture, but that was the stuff that was approved by the censors and written by the propagandists. So you had your official satire, your official comedy, the stuff that was allowed and that was that served a propaganda propaganda purpose. And then you had the underground one. Well, we have. We have a version of that too, where we have the official, well, not the official, but we have the the mainstream approved politically correct comedy, which isn't funny at all. At all. And then you've got the the um, the somewhat underground. Um, I don't even know what word to call it. Um, well, I'd like to comment on something fringe. you just said. You Harrison. could call it fringe. Yeah. Because you you mentioned that there's this this whole kind of uh, politically correct segment of of comedy that's uh, that's approved, and um, there is a uh, there was a YouTube personality. She's a Indian woman, and I forget her name. I think it's I'm just going to say Indira Singh. Uh, but apparently, she had this very successful YouTube program, and she made the transition to prime time late night. I don't know what channel or, or station she's on. But there were clips shown of her program, and basically the one running theme throughout her entire show is that she's not a white man. She sings about it, she mentions it during most programs, and she's conventionally uh, politically correct. And as one observer uh, put it, that there's 
absolutely nothing funny about her. Mm-hmm. And all the clips mm-hmm. that he that he played of her show were horribly not funny <laughs> or utterly banal. And uh, and she she parlayed this this YouTube personality she created into this very uh, idiotic, juvenile, politically correct, humorless, toothless, uh, lack of insight, lack of intelligence uh, program. Wow. And it was interesting that, that this commentator on YouTube, who I'd never heard of, his, his particular program had over 3 million views or some crazy mm-hmm. high number, which said to me that there are a lot of people who have the same observation and who are interested in, in the fact that she's become this uh, personality who, who, who's managed to parlay her idiotic routine into this mass-consumed consum- program. And she's talentless. Mm. So uh, there is that flip side. Well, people are getting braver. They are. Well, like when I saw most of Dave Chappelle's thing, I, the first thing I thought was, this is a man who's made his money and just, doesn't care anymore. And if this is a career ending show, he's totally fine with it, mm. which I thought was a wonderful stance to take. And it, it's a gamble that paid off. But there was another uh, comic. He's an Indian guy and he is funny. He can be funny, but he went off on the same kind of riff. You know, basically if you're white, you're, you're useless and pointless and blah, 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 trying to be funny about it. People got up and walked out left the show. So people, Good. there are people who are just finally saying, you're not funny. I don't care if I paid for a ticket, I'm leaving. So, so maybe that tipping point is coming you know, where people just go, yeah, Dave Chappelle, you rock, you know, and Mr. Burr, carry yeah. on. It's almost as though, even if it's offensive, if there's an element of truth about it, that people can recognize that yep. people find familiar, that people have on the tip of their tongues or, or at the edge of their awareness that is brought into the light of an explanation through the form of a joke, mm-hmm. they celebrate it. Mm-hmm. That, that was George Carlin's genius. He could go up there and he could insult certain segments of the population or certain ideas because he had the conviction based on truth, based on real uh, powers of observation that he had, mm-hmm. that he was correct and he knew how to deliver it. Well, the best ones take no prisoners. The best ones, you're yeah. all up for it. You know, if you only have one hobby horse to ride in on, you're not really a comedian. You know, not not somebody who's really going to use your gift for the benefit of all and for the <laughs> for the mocking of all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I think to wrap up, I'm going to tell a few more jokes and read the um epigraphs is that the word that uh lewis includes at the beginning of his book maybe i'll start with the epigraphs and end with the jokes so the first is from anthony ashley cooper the third earl of shaftesbury the higher the slavery the more exquisite the buffoonery (laughs) and then ernst roll within an interview with the author it's the law of faust the worse the times the better the jokes and then finally from the master himself, Karl Marx. The final phase of a historic political system is comedy. And uh, proof correct, oh, I boy. think. So Marx, <laughs> Marx had it right. And um, About something. Yeah. So now just a, a, few, a few jokes. We didn't tell the classic one, um, which was everywhere in the communist countries. So long as the bosses pretend to pay us, we will pretend to work. And now a, co- a couple more anecdoti. Midnight, Petrograd. A red guard's night watch spots a shadow trying to sneak by. Stop! Who goes there? Documents. The frightened person chaotically rummages through his pockets and drops a paper. The guard's chief picks it up and reads slowly, with difficulty. Urine analysis. <laughs> hmm. A foreigner sounds like. A spy, looks like. Let's shoot him on the spot. Then he reads further. Proteins, none. Sugars, none. Fats, none. You are free to go, proletarian comrade. Long live the world revolution. (laughs) (laughs) 
another. Question. Is it true that there is freedom of speech in the Soviet Union, just like in the USA? Answer. In principle, yes. In the USA, you can stand in front of the White House in Washington, D.C. and yell, down with Reagan, and you will not be punished. Equally, you can stand in Red Square in Moscow and yell, down with Reagan, and you will not be punished. <laughs> and uh, that's good. Maybe, uh, maybe one final one. Yeah, this is another good Stalin one. A secretary is standing outside the Kremlin as Marshal Zhukov leaves, the, leaves a meeting with Stalin, and she hears him muttering under his breath, murderous mustache. She runs in to see, to see Stalin and breathlessly reports, I just heard Ju Zhukov say murderous mustache. Stalin dismisses the secretary and sends for Zhukov, who comes back in. Why, who did you have in mind with murderous mustache, asks Stalin. Why, Joseph Vissarionovich. Hitler, of course. Stalin thanks him, dismisses him, and calls his secretary back. And who did you think he was talking about? <laughs> so, with that said, if you want some more um, communist jokes, then and check out Hammer and Tickle by Ben Lewis. And an excellent analysis of communism from its beginning to its end. Yes, indeed. In jokes. Then, uh, then check it out, and maybe if you if you happen to have any good communist jokes, um, put them in the in the comments on YouTube because mm -hmm. we'd like we'd love to hear them. Um, so, yeah, thanks everyone, and uh, we'll see you next year. This will be our last show um, of the year. We'll see you in the new year in 2020. And we hope that your Christmas and holidays are uh, are healthy and happy and uh, filled with lots of good things and some good humor. And that isn't politically correct. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks for listening, everyone. And Merry Christmas, if we're going to be politically incorrect. Yes, yes. I, I started with Merry Christmas, and I, but I added the happy holidays. Right. And um, give yourself a nice present next year by hitting the subscribe button and uh, finding out when our new shows come out. And so, tell a friend. Yes. All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs>